I can speak firsthand. I have learned so much about forecasting and analyzing properties all from Dan. Um, he does hold a master's degree in business analytics from the University of Denver and a bachelor's degree in economics and entrepreneurship from Bentley University. Um, so I am super excited to have him here on today. I believe Dan is has his, yep, he has his presentation already pulled up. So I'm gonna let him take it away. Um, welcome, Dan, go ahead. Thanks so much, Sarah. Super happy to be back. Uh, looks like it's being recorded and transcribed. I think the only other shout out would be, uh, please add questions to the Dory. Maybe yeah. Sarah, you could uh, paste Let the Dory in the chat. Yep, I did um, make a Dory. I will paste that in. I will also be monitoring um, the chat on the side if folks have questions. Dan, how do you want to handle, do you want people to pop in during the session and ask live questions? Do you want to respond to the chat? How do you want to handle let's that? Let's just, let's block off like 20 minutes at the end. Obviously the Q&A is some of the most juicy parts of all of this. So let me just give you my little presentation and I'll open up the last 20 minutes for anyone to ask a question or Sweet. have a discussion. Sweet, so let's get rolling. So the overview of the presentation, we're gonna start with the why, uh, we're gonna go with the how, why should you build a geodome? How do you actually go about building one? There really was no comprehensive guide online on the internet. So this presentation is an attempt for me to kind of pay back uh, to the next person that's trying to do this to avoid going through some of the pain and underestimating that I went through in building one of these. Uh, there's only a few thousand geodomes on Airbnb in North America, and they're really cool. Um, I'm gonna talk about what mistakes you could make, what mistakes I made in the process, and how it almost went completely wrong and got destroyed midway through the build, um, and then we'll open it up for the Q&A. Uh, so what I built was a 27-foot luxury geodome. This picture that you see here on this slide is actually from a company called Geoship, who's in the process of scaling up a bioceramic dome company. But I think, uh, if you're going to build one for Airbnb, kind of the plastic and steel frame uh, tents, the glamping tents are probably the best option. So a link to the presentation. Um, there will be afterwards. If you guys want me to send out one right now, I could. So let's just get through. Um, so why build a geodome? The geodomes have a unique charm and appeal for travelers. In the, the curve of most unique and cool Airbnbs, geodomes are at the top of that curve with things like you know, tree houses and A-frames, yurts. They're, they're really alternative structures that got popular for the geodome in more like the 1970s. Uh, this genius inventor architect called Buckminster Fuller uh, came up with the geodome. And it's seen the kind of resurgence lately in popularity. It really appeals to this growing market trend of experiential travel where people are spending less on physical goods and they're spending more to have experiences with friends and family that they love so that was kind of the why behind it is let's capture like the latest trend that appeals to gen z and millennials who are slowly becoming the largest uh, market share within the hospitality segment but they have the potential for very high returns um, and they don't really cost as much as a permanent structure, but have some downfalls because of that. And they're pretty versatile. Um, you can put them in a lot of different climates. They work better in remote places, probably than cities. Uh, but I think you're gonna see a lot more of these things popping up closer to the product that GeoShip is making than maybe what I put up. But this is an example of what you could do right now to build one of these. So the first step in all of this is trying to figure out where the geodome goes. And honestly, this is the hardest part is figuring out like, where am I gonna put this? Not only from like an analytical perspective, which we're not really gonna talk about like how you choose a location here, but when you do like decide on a general area, like you need to find a plot of land, which can be tricky as well for people who haven't done that. My best advice for you is that these are a lot easier to do and a piece of land that is that can be converted or is already commercially zoned than it is in a residential area. The residential uh, zoning uh, permits and control, it hasn't really caught up to the trend of glamping. And especially where I built this in South Central Colorado, there's a lot of people living kind of in squalor, in RVs, 
um, and temporary structures. And the zoning rules are set up to discourage that. Where if you want to build a house, you actually, or if you want to build a temporary structure, you need to have a permanent structure on property. Hey, John, would you mind uh, meeting? So my first advice is to go for a commercially zoned parcel. That's, you don't have to do that. I actually built a geodome on a residential plot and like not included in this presentation, but included in what I'll tell you about how I did it is that to build the geodome, I had to build a house. I actually had to build a house to have to allow to be allowed to have a temporary structure on the property. And, that te and the permanent structure had to be completed before the temporary structure could even start. But I wanted to do it in the residential area because I didn't have to dig a well. I didn't have to get uh, a septic system, which at the time in the pandemic had really long lead times. So I found some plots of land in a subdevelopment near a national park that had city water, sewer, and electric you know, somehow built out in this whole development. And land was like 40K an acre. So I built my business model. I built my why. I pulled all the data together. And I set up to do this. But most importantly, the only way I could do this is to find a general contractor that could help me. Like you could general contract this yourself. There's aspects of this that you kind of have to general contract yourself. But if you haven't built anything from the ground up or estimated construction costs, like you're gonna you're gonna underestimate significantly. And I underestimate significantly, even with a general contractor. Like my builder who built the cabin next to this house that rent together like was very reluctant to help me build this geodome. He didn't know how it worked. He didn't know the dimensions. And it took us a long time to figure out the exact dimensions of things like the deck, um, the subfloor, where at the, early, at the beginning of the project, there was a lot of question marks, including how much this would cost. But once you figure out like the zoning and once you have a plot of land, you need to probably the next step you need to do besides like obviously planning and building your business model is to order the actual structure itself. And um, this was a learning process for me. I started by contacting and calling all the domestic suppliers. The biggest one out of Washington is called Pacific Domes. They also have a yurt division called Pacific Yurts. I think they manufacture these um, on, uh, in the US, but from what I can find, the vast, vast majority of the manufacturers for these are all located in Asia and China. So instead of paying Pacific Domes $23,000 for the frame, the, the cover and the accessories, which is a pretty long list of accessories. It's the insulation, it's the, um, it's like there's two pieces of insulation, there's a glass door, there's a curtain, there's a solar fan. Uh, there's a lot of things that go into this besides just the, the frame and the cover, but you're gonna wanna pick out like all of what you wanna have. It came in a box that fit on a small box truck and I needed a forklift to get it off the truck. But then the final shipper told me I didn't need a forklift and it shows up and it turns out I did, and they kind of just like slid it out of the truck and then slowly drove away and then the box flipped over on its side. And there's a glass door in the center of this. And I'm like, oh my God. So this laid like this for about two months on my property before I was able to open up the steel welded box it came from on a boat from China that cost me $8,500, including shipping instead of the Pacific Dome's $23,000. So one of the first biggest costs is like the structure and the accessories itself. Yeah, Sarah, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, I think it would be helpful just seeing the cost difference um, here. One question I do have is at the end of the day, if you had to go back, would you have gone through the Pacific Domes route since it sounds like it has all the bells and whistles and less of a headache or are you still happy with your decision? I would go straight to Alibaba again. I would okay. not pay Pacific Domes 23K. I found another distributor, glampingdomestore.com, and I started talking to them and it became obvious that they were just reselling stuff from China. They're like, it'll be a 12 week lead time. I'm like, why is there a 12 week lead time? You're in, you're in Canada. It's like, oh, you're putting on a boat from China. It's like, okay, let me go into Alibaba and look it up. And like the part list that this company sent me, it wasn't Pacific Domes, it was the glamping store one. It exactly matched the part list that I got from the factory. That was like, which accessories do you want? Like the pictures were the exact same. So I think Pacific Dome started doing it this way. I think they have some manufacturing in the US. It's effectively the exact same product. And you can get the same product from a lot of different manufacturers. The Foshan Tengtai Tank Company is the one I used. I think it's on Guangzhou. Uh, if I pronounced all that right, I didn't, I'm sorry. But anywhere from an eight to 12 week lead time, this could take you. And that's honestly not really that bad at all. 
Uh, it took me about like eight, nine months to build the house. And then within building that house, it was only a two to three month. And it could have been compressed if I wanted it to be a process to build the Geodome. So it doesn't take that long, but there's I have a lot of steps. And yes, you can, you can buy pergolas, a lot of stuff direct. What's inside the box? You're about to see what's in the box. Yeah, you could just start a drop shipping company where you could just resell these and, and double the price if you really wanted to. But I think like operating and uh, managing them is a little more fun. So, uh, you know, after you purchase the structure and it's like it's shipped to you, there's 12 weeks till it gets there. You have to do the site prep and the backfill. You can see the cabin being constructed. And this is kind of the 80 foot walkway between the cabin and the dome. I don't rent them separately because I'm in a residential area that doesn't allow it. Also because of some difficulties I'll tell you about. But there's a lot more cost to building a dome than obviously just the structure itself. And like you need a level foundation. Uh, you need a level ground to be able to put the foundation on and you need to potentially even do excavation for utilities. I decided to daisy chain power and water from the house over to the site of the dome, which is like kind of how I could hack it in this residential area. They wouldn't let me run power and, and water to the dome directly. But if I ran into the house and ran into the dome, daisy chain just means like I'm bringing it to the house and then I'm bringing it over to the dome from the house's connection. I'm not going from like the, the street to the dome. I'm going from the street to the house with the power and water and then in the sewer and then i'm going with my water and my power over to the dome and i brought power into the dome itself yeah similar to what you would do with an adu this is this actually was permitted as an adu it was called an art studio when i submitted the designs for the house and within where i was permitting it you're allowed to have an art studio that was up to x percentage of the house and they didn't ban geodomes they banned yurts but they didn't ban geodomes so it's kind of like a hack to do one of these. Yes, this will be recorded. If you're joining late, don't worry, you can catch up um, and get where I started. But all you basically missed if you just joined was the structure. Get the structure straight from Alibaba, figure out what the cover and the utilities and the accessories that you want to put inside of it. But I think it costs about $3,000. I was just talking to my builder and reviewing this to be like, did I get all these numbers right? We had about 600 bucks of dirt to backfill and we had to spend a few thousand dollars to, to prep the site and bring over those utilities with one of those big excavators. But you want to think about some considerations. I wanted this to be the nicest geodome in North America or one of the few of them. So I wanted to put a hot tub on it and I wanted to put an outdoor shower. I didn't bring the water into the geodome itself because a geodome is not a permanently heated structure. And in Colorado, where I built this, it gets unbelievably cold. It gets so cold that people cannot even sleep in the geodome for two weeks out of the year and they go sleep in the house. So the, there's some people that run glamping setups that shut down for the winter. I have tried to stay open for the winter pretty successfully, but it's still challenging, even with the insulation that I'll show you. But you want to think about what is going to go into this, like how extensive is it going to be? But you have to design a deck next. This thing needs to go on a raised platform above the ground so water doesn't get into it. You can put it straight on the ground. You can put it on gravel. You'll find some examples of it. But if you want to make a luxury product that sells for a lot, like you can't. You need a platform deck. So I just designed a deck myself. I think I opened Smart Draw and I just started drawing lines. I, I pulled up the seven meter size of the dome. I laid it in the software how to keep it warm. Yeah, we'll talk about that, how to keep it warm and cold. You just put that in like, put all this stuff in the, the dory so you guys can, can vote on it. Um, but you want to design the deck relative to the geodome, obviously, and you don't want to waste a lot of material. You can see in like the bottom left and bottom right, I sliced it off at 45 to cut off some wood. But then my initial original design did not have extra space outside on the deck. I originally budgeted about 50K for this whole project and you'll see how much I spent on it at the end. Uh, but I wanted to have, I decided to add the hot tub. The hot tub requires more reinforcement, more foundation, more decking. It required about seven feet additional decking outside of, and it's already a 27 foot geodome. So this is a really, really large deck. But there are local regulations that you're going to have to think about in terms of whether you need railings or not. What's the height of this deck? Do they require lights to be on the outside of it? We had to deal with all of those and those inspections that occurred at the end of this to make sure we met those regulations. Correct, 27 foot is the diameter of this. 
Uh, I think it's really nice to give outdoor space. You'll often see people just build a deck the exact size of the dome and just build a square one. And you can probably build a deck for as cheap as maybe 10,000. I spent closer to probably 30,000 on this, trying to make it um, really, really luxury. But after you design the deck, you should design the inside. I just did a really bad Photoshop up of, I'm gonna do a divider wall. I'm gonna put three beds. I'm gonna put a couple closet spaces a wood fireplace and a couple seating areas around a table. So this is almost exactly what it looked like, but I don't know, sketch out what the interior is gonna look like. And to do this, I'd say just look at examples. Like I went on Pacific Domes' website, I found 60 examples of other people's domes. And, and then I just found out like which ones I liked. And most of them had this divider for sleeping area, which kind of gives a little bit of privacy. I call this two bedrooms. I kind of like lie on Airbnb. I'm like, I have a four bedroom property. It's a two bedroom house and it's a two bedroom dome. And like people kind of call me out on it, but it's, it's kind of two bedrooms, even though they're not enclosed. But you want to put some unique things. I got some like really cool backlit space themed artwork off Etsy and mounted up in the wall. I had my mom, a quilter, design this quilt that you kind of see that's badly sized in this picture. It had, it was supposed to be this like fractal explosion of a supernova. Didn't he's come up exactly like that, but like put some cool stuff in here and people will reward you for it. But think about what the interior is gonna be. But here you can see the shot of the foundation. So the foundation are probably just gonna be concrete piers. Uh, you want to think about local codes, soil depth, frost depth. Like this is why I needed a, a contractor to do this. Like a general contractor will charge, you know, 10 to 20% of the hard and soft costs of doing a project. But if you're not, if you're just like a, a Googler, you're probably not a general contractor that can do this. So for your first one, you're going to have to find someone that's going to sign up to help you do this. Uh, and the foundation that we end up pouring all those concrete piers cost $3,000. And you can see that if you really look closely in the far left corner of this, you can see that there's a, a few extra piers that go under where the hot tub's gonna go. If the hot tub is super heavy, it's gonna have seven people in it. It needs to have extra load. And we need to think about like the load of this whole thing relative to the deck as well. But the next step is building a deck. We talked about the importance of the deck, raising it above the ground, so critters and water, it's harder to get in. Um, I didn't know like what the deck, there's a bunch of like random guides over hot tub or geodome decks. No, I, I didn't need a structural engineer. Um, I didn't know how to build the deck and I had to like call up ge geodome companies, these you know drop shippers and be like, you know, give me some info. I might buy it off you. I had to just like call people and have them send me designs and schematics because my builder and I had no idea the exact size of this deck while we we're going into it and we only figured it out about six months into the house after i could you know pick up the phone call enough people that could send me enough schematics where he could be we could be like okay for the 27 foot diameter dome like this is the right size but we used the same framing crew from the house and it was like the last time they worked for my builder because they moved away and they were really high quality framers but they were fairly expensive since they were like some of the best in the market i think the labor and the materials cost uh 20k and you want to think about things like the decking material. Like you could use wood and it'll be cheaper, but it'll degrade at, and it'll kind of break over time. I think Trex is kind of the gold standard right now for this like artificial wood surface that is going to last longer. But you want to think about really closely what size deck. And this is a huge cost in building it. And here are the, you know, some in process uh, steps. You want to frame out the deck on top of the piers. You see we had like these big, I think they're four by four foundation blocks with two by fours framed all over it. And then you want to build a subfloor and the subfloor goes on top of this framed out deck before you put like the flat boards on it. And the subfloor allows this geodome to sit two, three inches above the rest of the deck. So water can't just seep into it. And not everyone puts a subfloor, but it's kind of the gold standard for building a geodome. And once you finish the subfloor, then you'll install the treks you know, on the non flooring area of the geodome, kind of the outside area, if you want to have that. And you just apply, you just put, as you can see in this last picture, plywood and plastic over uh, the subfloor. So moisture you know, from underneath is kind of an issue as well in a geodome. You don't want, like we had to grade the foundation so water would slope away from this. Like you don't want to have there be standing water under the dome. How to deal with the settling issue of the deck. I would say just like have a good general contractor, do your soil measurements, like engineer this to be able to withstand. Um, some settling and still be fine. 
So what's next? What's next once you have that deck is the structure itself. So you need an experienced crew, but the caveat is you won't find an experienced crew because there's so few of these that there are no general contractors that like I build, you know, kits from, from Alibaba for no, it's like those people don't exist. What I ended up doing was taking the crew that I had used for my golden Colorado Airbnb. They had, you know, they had cut trees for me. They had, you know, they had put in part additional parking spots. They had done flooring. They had done random stuff for me. And I know they were reputable contractors. So I hired a crew of four for a weekend to build the structure and cover it. And I ended up hiring probably four fewer people than I needed to really do this. I probably needed uh, close to eight people and I only brought four. It took one full day to build the frame, which is all of these steel pieces. How do you find a general contractor? Um, the way I found mine, I found a market that I thought would be a profitable place to build. I found a house on Airbnb that did really well. And I asked the host, it was a new build. And I asked them who built it. And they gave me the builder's name. And I said, like, this guy already built the most profitable Airbnb. Like I'm gonna have him build me the same. But otherwise it's hard. Finding a good general contractor is, is difficult and it's risky. So that's probably one of the hardest parts about this whole process is finding a reputable crew. Like my crew, they brought a couple like younger people in their crew that were not experienced. They thought this was gonna be easier than it was and they did not bring enough people. And I was on site the whole time being like, no, 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 no. You, you, this is the order of those metal things that come to six joints. They have to be in a specific order front to back to have structural integrity. I was like, no, 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 this is how it, this is how it has to happen based on the videos, guys. So if I wasn't there, being the general contractor for this stage onwards, it would have gotten done wrong. And it actually kind of was a disaster where it took us one full day to build the geodome structure. And then it took us the other day to put up everything else around it. So you install the insulation and then you need to install this aluminum foil layer and then the white PVC membrane. If you're building it in a cold location, if you're building it in a temperate or warm location, you won't need this insulation. Uh, this gets done from uh, to the inside. Let me back up a second. So this is on this picture. So this scaffolding that you see in the middle of the picture, we were not prepared for how tall this was. Like we brought some ladders. They did not reach the top of the structure. And the house happened to be, uh, had a stucco crew that was there that week that had left their scaffolding, this like tall metal and wood structures inside of it. They left their scaffolding on the house. So we're like, oh my God, thank God. There's the scaffolding that we need to finish this project. So it was super lucky. We would have had, like, if we didn't bring the scaffolding ourselves, we would have had to come back next weekend and do this. Um, but all the things they had to install were the insulation, the solar fan, the curtains, the glass door. Um, and I had the same crew do the flooring inside. And it cost me about $4,000 to pay them. And this was backbreaking, unbelievably difficult work. Here's a couple like in process pictures. So after you get that insulation up, you get this like really light um, aluminum foil layer. And then you put that white PVC membrane in the top right that you see being pulled over the dome. And this was like one of the hardest physical difficult things I've ever done. Uh, we didn't have enough manpower or you know people power, if you will. We tried to use trucks to pull it. The rope kept snapping. We would get it halfway over and it would fall off on the yeah. side. And what actually happened was this crew was in the bottom right you can see what it looks like when it's fully stretched down and tight there's actually like horizontal metal bars with these j hooks that asphyxiate the uh, pvc membrane down to the uh the structure and we weren't able to get it centered enough to clamp it down so for two weeks this thing sat there without kind of just like a plastic layer on top of a bowl and eventually a storm came and blew it off before my crew could come back and we had to do that whole step all over again and I should have got a crane. You know, whoever just said a crane, yes, I should have hired a crane and that would have made this way easier. But I went for a bigger geodome than I thought. I was like, bigger is better. Let's get a great geodome. And if you, when, you get, when you build a geodome this large, it just requires a lot of manpower to build it. And that's something you may not account for early on. But there's even like really small finishing aspects that didn't come with the kit. You can see in the bottom right, there are small aluminum strips that are screwed into the base that are kind of like the, the geodome is essentially just a bunch of flaps that hang out over the subfloor and like, I don't know, mice and, and rodents can get into there. So to stop rodents from entering any warm space, you have to like make it airtight. So we had to add some aluminum foil strips 
And then you have to put flooring inside the dome, right? It can't just be plywood. I mean, it could, but that's not going to be a nice experience. I see people put like cheap carpet. Ew, I would never do that. I decided to put luxury vinyl plank. It could even just be like the wood decking. You could just have like the wood deck there and that could be fine. But honestly, if you want to make it as luxury as possible, uh, put LVP. It's waterproof, it's durable, it's scratch proof. This is a pet friendly area. Um, mine was about $5,000 for the 600 square feet of area. But there's even like some small little things like the door threshold. There was like a two inch gap between the bottom of the door and the and the floor beneath it, which was called allowing water to get in. So we had to add additional thresholds. Like I didn't, we didn't get the perfect sized uh, subfloor. We were off by a few inches. So we had to add a little bit of like structure to be able to even install the whole structure down. But you're also gonna wanna think about, as I said, in like the early design phase, you're gonna wanna think about what the interior looks like. And a lot of people have some type of divider or even a loft space. I really did want to do a loft like this, these things are so huge you could have almost like a second story since this is like 27 feet tall like you could have kind of a second story where people can stand up that's more than like six feet off the ground but this kept being bigger and more and creep the creep scope kept coming up that you know, i had to just kind of get it done so i decided to do a wooden divider so that i could put some outlets uh some light switches some lights and so I could have the privacy of dividing the sleeping areas. So this ended up having a little bit of an L in it so it could have more structural integrity. It was originally just a line. And then my builder's like, this thing's gonna tip over. Like let's throw like two, three feet of kind of a wrap around in it. Uh, but this was just buying a bunch of wood and having a, a contractor go install it into that uh, finished place. But I think it's really important to think about the experience of being inside the dome and what it's gonna be like. But Installing electricity into this dome was not cheap, but it, it adds that luxury tier. And it's the only way I could really make this a good experience. The dome gets really hot in the summer and it gets really cold in the winter and at night. A lot of people put in wood stoves to heat the geodome. I don't want my guests have any, to have anything to do with fire or wood or maintain a stream of wood. So what I did was I decided to install an electric garage heater into the geodome with a, thermo a thermostat so people could use a remote and they could say heat turn off without starting a fire because people are not really experienced starting a fire and i don't want my dome to burn down so i had to we had to run enough power into the dome to so i could hardwire up the electric garage heater so that we could have the the hot tub um connected at all times and that so i could have Know, roughly four to five outlets. I had an electric fireplace also inside. I had like a little mini fridge that we'll see in the final photos. Like your general contractor and your electrician will need to estimate the electrical needs of this. And if you don't do all of these extra things I do, like you might be able to get away with much cheaper. I think it cost us about $7,000 all in um, to get the power into the whole unit. And we had to add some additional lights because of uh, local codes onto the outside of the deck. So it's not just like a, an edge you walk over because I didn't put railings on. Uh, but this is something that was difficult to estimate early on and went a bit over budget. But again, we used the same electrician that worked on the house to add these all in. You also need a plan for long term. Like this is a temporary structure. This is not a permanent structure. The cover has a shelf life. The shelf life is probably five to 10 years, depending on how well you maintain it. And maintenance is, is the key word there, where you need to clean this, you need to have your contractor use kind of special soft bristles on the front glass and special cleaning supplies on the PVC. It got really dirty when it fell on the ground, when it blew off that first time we got it back on. Uh, so I've, I've had to clean off some dirt and dust and I've had to make some small updates and improvements and maintenance. Not all the parts that came with it were super high quality. And the first guest that used the geodome snapped the door handle right off. And the door kept locking people in. So, you know, there's been some challenges with the quality that I've had to work through, but it's at a pretty stable place right now. But you're also gonna wanna think about like if you have the hot tub and a deck, like there's upkeep and maintenance on that. And even eventually the steel frame will need to get replaced. But I think for how much money that you can make on these, it's kind of worth sometimes making a depreciating asset. 
Like my hack here was to make an appreciating asset in the house with a depreciating asset next to it. And kind of offset and allows me to earn a, a huge premium for the uniqueness of it all. But you want to make sure you have a contractor, you want to give them a schedule, you want to understand what tools and supplies that you need on an ongoing basis to maintain this thing and run it. And you want to think about miscellaneous stuff. I only had 1.5 baths in the house and I wanted this, like essentially this, this uh, geodome was essentially an occupancy hack. Like one of the formulas for how much you can make is how many you know, beds you have and the price per bed. If I can go from two beds in my house to five beds overall, like I could charge more than 2x what the house alone would rent for. But I only had 1.5 baths in the house. I didn't put a bath or a kitchen in the geodome. There are some geodome manufacturers. If you're interested, look up F Domes as a company out of Poland. They sell really cool modular kits for interior geodomes, like kitchens and bathrooms. Like if you're putting it in a place where you're not worried about the water pipes freezing, like you can build the in in interior of this out even more significantly than I did. And if it's a standalone rental, like you need to plan for where do people use the bathroom? Where do they cook food? Where does trash go? And those were really hard things for me to solve. This is why I put this with a house and I can say, go use the bathroom in the house, go use the kitchen in the house. I don't even give you a grill out here because there's like animals and bears and in Crestone, like bears know what refrigerators look like and they break in houses to get them. So I wasn't really confident that if guests had food in this, I would be able to keep them safe. So I say no food in the geodome. That's the password to my Wi-Fi when they pass along to previous guests, to other guests, no food in the geodome. Uh, but you want to think about the miscellaneous things, whether they're like the kitchen or the bathroom inside, or whether they're just simple things as like the electric heater or the wood burning stove that you're going to use, what outdoor furnishings you're going to put. I built a little table next to the hot tub. I put these two little you know, modern chairs and two lounge chairs out there. And I put a, I put a big outdoor deck box for all the supplies for the hot tub. I think it costs about 4K uh, for the outdoor shower, the base, and all of the outdoor furniture and stuff. But uh, the outdoor shower was a way for the summer to add that second shower, but it's not a great experience for people. It's not like an enclosed outdoor shower. It's just like a platform. You, if you look really, really closely, you can see it in this picture to the left of the geodome, the outdoor shower. And, um, and you can see it kind of like in the bottom corner of this as well. And in the winter, people are like, I can't use this. It doesn't help me. But in the summer, it helps me to try to force people to shower before they use the hot tub and muck it up. All in, it cost $88,000 and $800. This was all a part of a $450,000 house. And this was originally lined itemed out as at about 46K. I think we doubled it and I increased the size and the scope of the project. This is not including land, but this is including things like the geodome and everything else you saw in this presentation. But I was actually, I think I'm the only person in the US to have financed a tent on a mortgage. Since I added this as an ADU and I took a construction loan out, I was able to have the bank actually finance 80% of this. I only had to put 20% of it down. And I closed on the loan in December of 2021. So I only have a 4.4% interest rate. And I have like, I think my total mortgage and interest is 1800 bucks for the house and the geodome that I rent out for five to 600 bucks a night in pig season. So just know that like there are some unique and difficult hacks that you can do to build this and not have to finance it with all cash. And like the real ways to play that game is to try to build on the high end of the price per square foot in your area. Like we had to play this, this really tricky game where my builder had to call up the appraiser and had to be like, listen, I know this is a lot more expensive than all the two bedrooms around it, but look, here are the comps that you need to use to make this work. And like the guy on the local board that approved the permit was the guy at his electrician company that wanted to work on it. So in small towns, there's a lot of like in dealing, right? And it's like, you can often by knowing some people kind of get things pushed through or figure out kind of the hacks to get them done. But like you might consider this yourself as part of a new build, or you might consider it as part of like an addition to an existing structure you have to boost the uniqueness and the accessory dwelling uh, unit as like additional occupancy. But you need to market this. Like you can't just build it. People need to know about it. Like you need to take professional photos. I think the gold standard of Airbnb photos 
like Uzma has wedding photos on her Airbnb. Ask her about them. They're the best photos I've ever seen. I think the next level up is to put people and models in your wedding photos of your, of your unit. And if people can visualize themselves, if someone that looks like somebody is in the photos of your unit, they will convert at a higher rate than wide angle real estate photos. But as I was building this, Airbnb came out with a huge push for unique properties. They came out with the category update, which, and they came out with the OMG fund to fund crazy stuff like that. And I was like, you guys were six months too late. I already built that. Um, but this just goes to show that the, this trend of experiential travel is being pushed by Airbnb specifically. And if you build stuff that Airbnb wants to promote on this platform, like they will, I'll, I'll send out my info for those who want it later. Um, like, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, but when you're marketing this, like you can think about local tourism partnerships. I think a more important aspect is social media influencers. I've been having like bloggers and people that have local Colorado travel blogs come document it. I give them a free night in, ex in exchange for uh, a couple posts on Instagram and Facebook and, and YouTube. And we talked about financing this a little bit. Most people are just going to do all cash. Like I said, you can do this as part of a new house construction. That's kind of the hack of hacks to do this. You could get a small business loan. You get a private money loan. Here, I'll actually put Airbnb listing, airbnb.com slash h slash. Anyone wants to look at the listing that this geodome is on, we can find it in the chat. Uh, but you could get private money loan. You could get somebody that give you a 10, 12% interest loan to go do this and pay them back out of it. But I'm not your financial advisor or your lender. So go consult with a professional before you do that. So as a conclusion, I would do this again. There's some things I would do differently, like probably like planning the original scope out from the get-go and not just scope creeping the whole way. But for example, as just an example of how much this can add, as a standalone unit, you could probably average 150 to 200. You could probably make around 35K a year gross revenue, not net. But if you build this with all cash, um, then it'll be mostly profit. But it, it took a year of careful planning and attention to detail to get this done. It's all just a series of solvable problems that you guys all like know very well how to solve difficult problems. Like none of this was rocket science. It was just like, what's the size of the deck or what's it gonna cost? And, you know, just checking things off a list. But this leads to a really memorable experience, memorable experience. Instead of my house being a $250 house, the house plus the dome can go for 550 to 600. So it really allows me to boost my revenue. There's a house, somebody built a house next to me for $400,000. I built this property for 450 and they make $40,000 a year. And I make $96,000 total on this property. And this dome probably adds 35K to it. So a 20% increase in my construction cost led to doubling of a, of a house built by the same builder as me, five houses down, run by an investor that doesn't really know how to like market and launch and furnish stuff. And people keep saying that this was one of the most memorable and unique experiences they've ever had. There's obviously great views, it's near attractions, but like compared to my other properties, which are a relatively average mountain cabin in Golden, and I have a house hack in Chicago, like these reviews, they sell themselves for it. And like that's kind of why you do a project like this, because your, your guests will sell future guests and allow you to keep increasing the price. This is an example of some of the finished product photos. If you saw my listing, uh, you can check it out. I added some camouflage on top of it so the sun wouldn't degrade the PVC as much. I wasn't quite large enough to camo, but you can see what the camo looks like. Uh, you can see the sleeping areas here. It kind of has two singles and a queen. You see that like star quilt, UFO themed rugs, you know, cool little um mini fridges and some space to put your clothes and space to maybe change behind a privacy screen this was kind of like my vision built out for the geodome but you could make something a lot better and a lot cooler than this as well so i guess now, now is where you guys get to come in we've got 16 minutes left um ask upvote questions in the dory i guess don't type them in the chat anymore let's just stick to the dory and maybe sarah can help me uh, yes. be the moderator for the dory and if you want to Get in touch with me. There's my info. 
this is just me paying back the Google community that was so good to me. So I'm not really, I'm not selling anything. I'm just trying to you know, teach you how I did this and what went wrong. But if anything, subscribe to my YouTube, which I just started. Dan the Hype Man. Yeah, Their plans I'll give away for free if anyone wants them. We are definitely going to send all of Dan's deets and information in this presentation and the recording out. But I think let's use these next 15 minutes to answer some Dory questions. Um, Dan, I don't know if you want me to present, if that would yeah. be easy. Yeah, that would be you Stop sharing your screen and I will present. Uh, Yeah, how did I choose the location real quick? Well, I lived in Denver. I had just like made a map of every mountain town in Colorado and went through them one by one. Like I can't launch there. It's illegal. It's illegal. It's illegal. Okay, here's an area with a population center or like a draw, an attraction that I had been to. It was near a national park called the Great Sand Dune National Park. And I went through all of my research over like what's the trend of travelers? How many Airbnbs are there? Who are the more profitable Airbnbs? Where are areas that I could build near this park? And then I just slowly zeroed in on what you see here, what I built. Okay. Yeah. Let's start with some personal unique experience. Like you can't just like choose a dot on a map. You should start with places that you know and then validate them. Amazing. Let's um, take the first story question. Um, Ashley Lee, um, thanks for joining us. What are the tips on choosing the best market area to build geodomes? I think you just kind of answered this. Um, I think this could work in a lot of different places. And like my tips for choosing a market is either choose a market that you're in or choose a market that you would like to go vacation in. And don't just pick a market because you think it's going to be profitable. And like in terms of where these do better, remote mountain areas, they do a lot better than like, you're not going to put this in like the Midwestern city near a football stadium. Like you're going to put this into like a field in the middle of nowhere that looks at mountains. So you, you can do it anywhere you want, but that's probably where it goes best. So you bought a much cheaper dome from Alibaba. How's the quality? Is it holding up after one winter? Yes. It's besides the, like the handle on the dome that snapped off, which finding a replacement handle for that geodome door was not easy. I had to get the seller to ship me another one. Um, but it feels, it feels like it's kind of steady now. The locking mechanism on the door kept jamming on people. So the quality of like the door itself is my main complaint. But I think the quality of the frame is really solid and all the other accessories was really solid. And it, and it is holding up pretty well after just, it's up, been up for like nine, 10 months. How much of your time did it take in building this first project? How much time does it take now? A project like this is just a lot of hours over a very long period of time. And I think most of a short-term rental, most of the effort is to getting it up and running and getting well automated. And once you're up and automated, it can take you know, less than a few hours a week of your time. But it's, I probably put hundreds of, my, of hours of my time into this project. But on an ongoing basis, it takes very little of my time. Like for example, today, my cleaner messaged me and said, and what time do they leave? And I said, 10 o'clock. And then she's gonna show up, clean it, request the Venmo and it'll be ready for the next guest. And that'll be like as much work as I do in four days on it. But I'd say like you should you, know, you should plan to be able to do an Airbnb. Like I did my first three while I was at Google. And then once I got to three, it became kind of unwieldy to keep going, which is why I had to leave Google earlier this year. So I wouldn't be afraid to do your first or second while you're at Google, as long as you have some free time and you're not like fully booked out outside of work hours. Best way to determine zoning requirements when searching for land. Yes, this is what I did. I found the builder. He was like, he had built the number one Airbnb that I found on AirDNA. I was like, you're my builder. I was like, now let's find some land. I was like, I see a lot of pieces of land here, but I obviously know nothing about land and how much it costs to build on land. So I was like, builder, how about I send you out to these nine pieces of land and pay you a thousand dollars and then you pick me the land. <laughs> you know, there was like 10 different good options. I, I care about like neighbors not having trash near me. I care about good views. I care about like the things I can't tell from a bird's eye view, like the sources of smell or sound nearby. So I think pay a contractor that knows more than you to choose the land. And like, do not think that you can just open up Zillow and be like, that looks like a cool piece of land. And he helped me figure out the ADU hack. He's like, oh no, like I know that you can do an ADU. This is how we could do it, right? I didn't need to figure that out. But if you're just looking 
for commercial land, like you could find a commercial parcel to do this yourself. You could find a local realtor, tell them what you're looking for, and they could serve you up, you know, and maybe you could do the last mile, have your GC come in and say, like, how buildable does this look? What's my estimate for the cost to hook up utilities? And but if you have land already, then you're probably ready to go. What type of zoning is required for geodomes? Is it typically the same as multi-parcel zoning? Well, my geodome was uh, art studio and that was allowed. I'd say generally speaking, if you don't wanna build a permanent structure, you need a commercially zoned lot where they allow things like tents to be built and rented out where a residential plot won't. And it's possible to convert residential into commercial, but it's risky, difficult, often depends on the local board that's looking at it and how they feel about it. It sounds like the location you choose is kind of uh, remote. How hard was, yes, it's probably one of the most remote locations. It's outside of the smallest town in America that has, it's like three by three blocks. But like funny enough, because it's so remote, there are really few jobs available. So there, while there's not that many people, there's even fewer jobs. So there was actually a, a big pool of cleaners since it's, it's got a decent amount of Airbnbs. It was not hard for me to find a cleaner. The hard part was finding a good, reliable cleaner, which took cycling through three cleaners to find one that was reliable and at a price that I found agreeable. So it's really possible. I do, I manage all of these fully remotely myself. It's all about finding a local ground team that you trust. And when they mess up, firing them and hiring a new one. What are the best resources on geodomes recommended? Exterior materials. Um, materials to read on to learn about the life warranty. What are the benefits of geodome over a tiny house? Given tiny houses such as Vika One, somewhat com comparable in price. I mean, I don't know. I think like for me, I would only do a geodome again if I was probably gonna do multiple geodomes. And like you can put five or 10 of these down and make a ton of money. And there's, there's also other you know prefab or glampy or alternate structures you could do. And the hard part in life is that there's a million ways to make money. There's a million things you, you could do and like, solutions you could provide to people that they would pay a lot for. And you just kind of need to pick a lane and try it. And for me, this was kind of an experiment to see like, can I get the price I want? Can I execute this project? And like, will I want to scale this business model? So I didn't really have all the answers when I started, but I used it as a learning experience, which ended up making some pretty good money. But I think I am looking at some tiny home and prefabs for some of my next projects instead of potentially a geodome. But I don't regret building a geodome for this house. It's, it's really cool. Can you talk more about your first real estate investing projects and your experience with getting started? So I joined Google in the end of 2019 at the Boulder office and the pandemic started and my apartment lease was up. So I decided to buy a house. I always wanted to buy a mountain house um, growing up in the Northeast and seeing Vermont, New Hampshire, they were just the coolest things ever. And Boulder is at the base of the mountains. Like you can live in the mountains and commute to the office. So I was like, boom, I'm not gonna buy a million dollar flat in Boulder. I'm gonna buy a half million dollar mountain house. And then my wife was like, this is too crazy. There's animals, like, can we move to the city? And I was like, fine, but I get to launch it as an Airbnb. So we lived in the house for a year. We renovated it while we lived in there. Um, and I lived with, we moved and lived with our, my mom before I even had a second house because I wanted to cash flow it that summer so badly. So I like took some sacrifices to get my first project up and running and to get to my second, third, and now you know, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth this year. But you should get started by scraping whatever you can together and maybe like moving out of your primary residence and launching it. I see you're out of the Boulder office uh, too. So like, you know, you could do something similar. Boulder's hard to Airbnb in, but like Jefferson County, where I put my first house is, is not that hard. Seems like all in luxury dome will be 70 to 100K. Are you able to get insurance providers? That is a good question. Um, no, <laughs> this, this is the short. My insurance provider was like, we will absolutely not be providing structural coverage for the geodome. I do have general liability for the geodome and um, I have loss of income. I use like the landlord insurance provider. I use CBiz, but CBiz and, and proper are probably the two most recommended one. So CBiz insures this property, CBIZ, if you want to look them up. Um, yeah, and they were like, we're not giving you replacement value on the structure. And it's like, fine, <laughs> it's like, okay, whatever. These support all weathers. It's uh, not only seasonal, but cold at night and hot during the day. Yes, well, I, I live in, or this, 
property is in one of the most extreme weather areas of the, of the US, which is a huge challenge. The San Luis Valley gets really, really cold in the winter and it gets pretty hot in the summer. So I also put an AC that I put ducts through the ground for the exhaust and everything. So I gave people a heater and an AC unit, but that doesn't even, that's not perfect. When it gets under 20 degrees, it's too cold to sleep in. And in the summer, in the day, it takes a long time to cool down. But at night, super cool and nice. And this is more of like a sleep there at night than hang out there during the day. But it's certainly a challenge. And I think as I mentioned earlier, two times during the year, people mentioned that it was too cold to stay in the dome. But luckily, their group was small enough in the winter that they could just sleep in the house instead. Any tips to find a good general contractor? Honestly, no. I got really lucky with finding mine through finding the house that he had built. But I'm kind of scared to go to new locations to try to find a good GC. I say referrals are your best friend. Um, talking to people, the previous clients of a GC, right? What did he meet the schedule? Did he meet the timeline? Did he meet the price? And getting like previous clients to tell you if they like working with one is probably the best way to do it. Um, as well as like looking at some of their experience and making sure that they have built stuff that you would want yourself in the past. And yes, zoning is a complete minefield. I don't think there are any general rules. I mean, other than like if it was a commercial lot, this is going to be easier. And I, I see a remote out of Mountain View. I know California does have a statewide ADU law where they make it pretty easy to do some of this stuff. So in, in states like California, it may be a heck of a lot easier to put one of these in the backyard of your primary and have it make a lot of money than in other places where like in Chicago, where they're just rolling out the ADU laws. So it's it kind of different if you're trying to add this to a house and do it as a standalone. If you're doing it as a standalone, try to stay away from residential unless you have a builder that can help you hack it like me and you want to build a house and find commercial. But finding land is difficult. You probably need your general contractor and a realtor to help you do that. What's the cap rate and on total invested? I think this was a, a 175K invested given the overages I did in the geodome, I was down payment, closing, interest, furnishings, hot tub, cash out of pocket. Uh, it was it was under 200K, but over 100K to do this. And it nets about $40,000 a year on almost 100K revenue. So 40 out of you know 175, I think it's like 25, 30% return. So it's nothing like completely out of this world, but it's a solid return. I think in the Midwest, you could probably hack it higher. In the coast, you might see lower. But uh, this was kind of an experiment for me. But I also predicted this property to make the most amount of money in the market. And I did that. I am the top earning property out of 150 units. And that includes like nice four bedroom properties where I'm a two bedroom and a tent. So just know that like you can produce a, a property like this and you could immediately jump to the top of the list if you make it distinctive and intentional enough. Yes, cost, revenue, profit, how long it took you to break even. It's only been up for nine months. And it took me about six months of running it to really ramp it up, to start to bring my cost down, to bring my revenue up in line with my initial forecast. And now it's really starting to uh, produce kind of off of my initial forecast, which, which was to be the number one. So for example, in, I was just looking at my profit and loss for a single month, but um, in April, or actually, sorry, in March, I brought in $9,500 total revenue and my all-in costs were $4,700. So I made 5,000 profit in March. And this is a summer seasonal property. So it's certainly possible using these uh, projects to cash flow thousands of dollars a month. Uh, but it takes time to ramp up. It's not immediate out of the gun. How do you think about turnover between guests during the busy season, linens? Um, I do same day check in, check outs. I just leave uh, six hours, a 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. window to do it. And I let my cleaner know that it's the same day turn if it is. And the cleaner can do all the cleaning and linens in under six hours. So there's some tools you can use to streamline this. There's some uh, scheduling tools like Turno, Resort Cleaning, Tidy App. They will essentially take your Airbnb reservations, use rules and open, res open like appointments for your cleaner to accept and have a platform where your cleaner can send pictures, can check in that she's there or he's there, um, and you can even pay them on the platforms. So that's how I streamline it. These work in very steep environments, yes. Yes, you could just build the race platform, but it's more expensive, obviously.
yeah, the garage heater keep it warm. I think I talked about this. There is an AC um, that keeps it cool. The platform, oh. here, I'll type them in chat. Erno, resort cleaning, or tidy app. Those are the three that I know and like. Or you could just maintain a Google Sheet and add in dates like some hosts do and you know, CC your cleaner. Uh, how many years has the dome been set up? Only nine months since I finished it. I finished it September 12th last year I launched it. Types of uh, issues observed over the period of time. We talked about like the handle broke and a little bit of water got inside. There was some water damage and some flooring. This, we had to cut through the membrane to install a solar fan on the outside and the sealant on that hadn't sealed very well because they, there was a rainstorm the next day after it was installed. So we had to reseal that. But otherwise it's, it's held up really, really well. Uh, I talked about the maintenance a little bit. But yeah, it looks like we're at time. Yeah, we are at time. Thank you everyone for joining in and including these amazing questions. Uh, most importantly, Dan, thank you for the thoughtful and thorough details in your presentation. I know if you're feeling like me, I'm, oh, Dan is not in, hold on. Dan is not allowed to join. Um, let me see if I can get him back in. Let me, I don't know where he, did. I tried to admit him, but it didn't allow him. Um, if you're feeling anything like me, I'm really inspired and excited by all of this. And, you know, probably on the side already Googling, like where can I get commercial real estate nearby to launch one of these? Um, I wanted to just quickly give a plug. If you, I think many of you are subscribed to our real estate investor uh, Googler group, which is almost 9,000 people, which is incredible. Um, we also do have a smaller, uh, that is probably Dan. We do have a smaller uh, group that's a short term rental focused group. Um, if you're interested in joining, um, feel free to ping Anand. I'm going to ping in his MoMA page um, if you'd like to join in on that group. Otherwise, um, have a great rest of your day. Feel free to reach out. I'm a short-term rental host myself. Happy to answer any questions. If you're looking to start exploring this as an opportunity to invest in, happy to help in any kind of way. Um, have a great rest of your Friday and have a great weekend. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. Oh, hi, Dan. You're there. Appreciate everybody for coming. Thank you. Um, if you want to reach out and chat, feel free to. And maybe next time I'll give you guys the full story of the house and the geodome together and not just the yeah. geodome. But yeah, th Sarah, thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate you. Of course. Appreciate it. I will see you soon. Talk to you soon. You thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.